Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming this evening. Uh, firstly, on a health and safety note, I just want to point out the fire escapes over here on the left and up on the right. Um, on behalf of the Institute of Civil Engineers Graduate and Student Committee and in conjunction with Engineers Ireland Young Engineers Society, I'd like, you welcome, like to welcome you here to the presentation on integration of BIM and surveying. Um, our speakers this evening are Alan Halpin uh, fra from Murphy Surveyors, the uh, BIM manager there, and Michael Dernan, the chief surveyor on the Lewis Cross City project, also from Murphy Surveyors. Um, so without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Alan and Michael. Hello, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Michael Dernan. Um, I guess I'm going to start off with a bit of an introduction about ourselves and what we're going to talk about and then Alan's going to jump in and I'm going to jump back in again. So we'll be a bit in and out. So if you have any questions at any time, feel free to kind of stop us at any time or if you want to wait to the end, that's fine too, so we can flesh it out. Obviously, it's quite a broad topic, uh, so we're it's kind of going to be more of an overview. Uh, uh, and if you want to talk about anything specifically, yeah, we'll, we'll feel free to ask questions. We'll jump in. So, um, who are Murphy Survey? I suppose uh, we're thirty uh, plus specialised survey services uh, with thirty years business and second generation family business. Uh, Home and accidents free, two hundred fifty thousand man hours. Eight offices in Ireland, UK, and the first for laser scanning in Ireland. I guess BIM is a big part of laser scanning, and we were first to uh, involve ourselves in laser scanning between Ireland and UK. We were first in the UK as well. So, um, quite a large amount of work carried out, and 170 plus staff at the moment, with 96 masters degree and diploma qualified. Obviously, we're a large part of societies ourselves, so we we like to be involved in in, in a lot of events like this. 500 plus BIM models produced and 20,000 surveys completed. So we've got a lot of experience, on hand experience of dealing with models, laser scanning and BIM projects. So that's where we are. Kildare is our main office, but we're also based in Dublin, Belfast, Glasgow, London. We have a couple of offices in London and in Cork, where Ireland is based. So some of our accreditations is Society of Charged Surveyors. Uh, we have done a number of CPD events for that, uh, for those guys as well. So, uh, and some of our clients are, I recognise some people in the room and even in the building that I met are part of the, the client list there. So, so some of our key surveys, I guess, will be integrated with quite a bit of these. So, underground utility surveys, 3D utility surveys, laser scanning, BIM, monitoring, property service, survey engineer, hydrographic survey specialist inspection services, which is a new service that we've just launched in the last couple of months. Uh, but I guess all of these things lead into one thing, how do you want to build up an asset and build up your survey data and build up your spatial information. So, so this is basically what we're going to be talking about. So Alan's going to be covering the BIM capture end. We're going to be talking about creating your model essentially in the beginning. Uh, I'm going to kind of take on from the construction side of things. So. BIM to field, field to BIM. I'm actually not a massive fan of the word BIM, so for me it doesn't actually relevant, it's 3D construction. So for me, so if we take data in 3D and we realize it in the field. So for me, kind of BIM is kind of a loose term. So it means a lot, it means specifically buildings, but uh, since we're gonna be talking a lot about infrastructure and civil works as well, it incorporates it all. So you can't really say drainage run has got something to do with a building specifically. So when it's 17 kilometers long or something like that. So um, field the BIM, so how do we bring, how do we kind of take the whole data back into BIM? So we're dealing with it, we create our design, bring our design into the field, take that to, uh, as the design, building it back into our BIM, build up our audits, our QA and QC procedures, and then build up an asset management which we deliver to our client at the end of the day. So. I'm going to hand you over to Alan, and Alan's going to kind of take on the BIM capture end. Hey there, my name is Alan Halpin. I'm the BIM manager for the Irish operations with Murphy Surveys. Um, again, I suppose Michael touched on it there. Um, it's more about 3D construction, 3D management rather than BIM. Um, BIM is a part of it. Um, and again, I mean, I suppose these these phrases we put up there, BIM to field, field to BIM. It's more about 
the treaty side of things and if you want to just change that word out feel free um, but I'll move on anyway just it's, ju it's just really to kind of categorize our kind of areas that we're involved in in a lot of different areas it's not just that we come out and give you one item there's a process to it there's a workflow to it there's lots of different workflows to all of this kind of stuff and it all depends on what you're looking for when you want it um, and the various ways we can deliver that information to you as well um, so again, starting with the BIM capture, that's the very first um, side for us. It's getting that information, it's getting that data. Um, it's not just about the guy with the tripod, it's everything. It's the guy with the tripod, it's the guys with him, it's the laser scanners, it's the information that we get, it's the information that we can store. We can give out some of that information, we can give out all that information. There's a lot more to it than just simply requesting one survey or a plan. Um, so I'll move on just from the capture and things. Um, some of the equipment that we use um, on the left we've got some Leica equipment we've got scanners we've got total stations in the middle we've got different types of laser scanners Z and F's for different types of work we use some of them for exteriors for a long range we use other types of scanners for the more detailed work inside if you want conservation recording we have types of scanners that will give us different types of detail different types of reliability um, and then on the right then we've got the more handheld portable um, scanners we can use that then for detecting rebar, detecting things up to about 100 mil inside walls. It's more of a, a detail focused item. Um, so again, all of this is down to what kind of information you need. Um, data capture. It's rapid. I mean, you can see the image on the bottom right. It pretty much tells you how much information is in that one shot that we need to get. Um, I think that kind of sums up. <laughs> our approach to it. We can get all that information to you or we can give some of that information to you. It depends. If you just want the structural elements there, we can scan the whole lot of that, give out the structural information, we can give the platforms, we can give the architectural elements. A lot of different types of information we can get from the same data set. Um, and it all comes down to what exactly you need. Um, but moving on, accurate to define tolerances is a thing that we, we kind of push a lot. Um, using scanners, there's a lot of information that we can pick up. Um, we're careful not to slow it down and pick up everything when something small is required. So again, it's down to what we need to get for a client. Um, we need to know things like tolerances, the accuracy, because all of that affects the types of scanners we use, the equipment we use, and the length of time we're on site. Um, if there's a lot of, you know, if, if there's major items required, we can filter out the small items and spend less time on site. That helps clients, it helps us, and um, it helps costs, more importantly. Um, and again, it makes it more affordable. Um, it's scalable. It allows flexible and tailored deliverables as well. Um, and just for anyone who isn't familiar with point clouds, you can see there's a lot of information we can gain. We've got the middle shot on the bottom. It's, it's a model built to, um, to a scanned image. The image on the bottom left is actually a scan. Um, there's a lot of images here, but I suppose the quality is what we need to focus on. We can give ultra high quality, we can give lower quality if just certain elements are required. That again speeds us up. Um, and in terms of our own workflows, it's leading point cloud quality and clarity. We've been developing this for quite a while. Um, for 13 years. Um, the in-house workflows we have then is just to kind of clean out some of the data. You can see you get quite a lot of noise in this. Careful. Um, filtering is quite an important aspect of this. Um, and again, the accuracy that we can actually give is anything down to 3 mil. And again, large scale on a large plant, I think it's for the speed that we can do it. Just touching on it, but I'll hand you over to Michael again for the BIM to field side. Um, I'm sure he'll keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. Just to touch on what Alan was saying there, one of the big things is like um, is really we can you can really capture whatever you want essentially within a point cloud, but it really has to be defined by the client or the consultant what you actually need. So uh, the approach and the approach that surveyors will take is really defined by the specification. How do you lay out exactly what you need? If you ask for everything, you will get everything. You get your scanners pick up a million points per second. You can you can capture as much as you want, but 
if you don't need all that information, well, you don't need to be capturing it in a point cloud. It can be sorted out traditionally. Like if you want to build a build model from a tape, like you can if you want to, but it doesn't, you don't necessarily need to do that. So the key thing is the specification of the capture end. We will talk more about it later on when we're doing the asset. We'll get into a lot more detail later in the, in the presentation about what you capture, what, how you should capture, what you should ask for. So Alan will kind of go into that bit more detail. Uh, but the same kind of thing, just leading on the same kind of thing about specification, BIM to field. Uh, I guess this is the number one thing I've been asked standing behind an instrument for 20 years. Uh, are you in the right field? Uh, why do we want the BIM? We, well, we want to know that we are. So <laughs> every single job I've ever worked on, somebody has asked me this. Like, so, uh, so, so, so there's two key elements for me for, for what I want to know. How I want to, you design the information, you give me the design information. How do I take that? and replicate and put it out onto site and build it. So I need to measure. So this, and the number one thing, and always for surveyors, is the control network. The only way you can take something that's measured in the beginning, build it, and then asset correct it correctly pop, is, is by having a very well-defined control network. Like, if the only way that uh, you can quantify how well you can measure something is by having an accurate con uh, control network. The stations that you use to define the, the, the room, like I have to set up over a station here and pick up the four corners of this room. If I know where this station is, well then I have a good idea that this will always be relative. But during the construction process, this station gets knocked out, I put it over there, that gets knocked out, I put it over there, that gets knocked out. So the propagation of errors during a construction process is really important to maintain that. So a properly well-defined, specified, control network is extremely important from the capture, from the construction, and from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the asset side. To be able to, there's too many times I've seen a very well spec survey, it goes to construction, does a well-defined grid, and then somebody throws in two Hilti nails and a retro target up on the wall and builds a 700 million pound job. It is not <laughs> the way that you should do it, you know what I mean? Why would you, why would you uh, afford yourself to do that. What is the risk of putting in steel in the wrong place? What is the risk of putting in bolts with precast units in the wrong place? It's high. The only way you can quantify how well that's going to be done is by having a proper control network in place on a construction site. And that goes from like a building to it's a um, civil works. Like it's, it's um, like you see, I guess that most people would see, most civil engineers would see the QBN. So that's for topo for QBM works. It defines the, uh, the, uh, the how well something should be surveyed right through its, its uh, and how well a uh, control network should be put in place. But I see that and then it goes to construction and it's completely ignored. There is nothing similar in the construction works requirements where it should be followed through through the whole continuation of the works. Coordinate system, scan data, BIMS actually doesn't have a coordinate system. It's actually uh, there is no map projection. It's all scale ones to one. Engineers scale ones to ones. It's surveyors that think that the world is round, and engineer thinks the world is flat, because everybody designs them ones to one. Where we have to take the information, put it back into Irish Grid or ITM, and project that back onto a curved earth. So we have to uh, incorporate map projections. What do I encourage? I encourage that you remove coordinate systems, put it in on a plain grid, define it at the beginning of the job, the scope of works. So that when it comes to design, that you're, that you're using it on a, a localized system, and then that you can, so during the construction process, that that is uh, implemented. I'll take an example of um, uh, the Olympic Stadium when I was built in the UK. They had a coordinate system in place, and they, they got to a stage where everybody that came to a site with a subcontractor had to submit their survey equipment into a localized office. They had to have the coordinate system loaded onto their kit everything deleted off it by a centralized source that the sort of errors weren't being, being made on site. They were finding 20 mil, 30 mil errors between different companies, like just because of the core system they were using. Like uh, uh, Irish grid is 22 mil in 100 meters in Dublin. So if you set up a total station measure 100 meters, you'd be 22 mil wrong if you use Irish grid as opposed to a localized grid. That's the kind of impact. So is it better for site then to have a localized site grid? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you remove that scale. Ask, for, you can have it. Like, you, what I always do, like if, if anybody does it, if you need to supply the, the end result in ITM, say for what is the goal, what is the only reason for that, it's, pro, it's legal. 
It's a legal reason that you have to supply the end result of your boundaries in ITM. Well, then ask for a, a transformation. So ask so when do you get the company to set up the grid that they have supply a transformation to ITM. So, well, wait, so you, you, sorry, yeah, to, sorry. If you're sharing information between, let's say, architects, engineers, and mm. between offices, how do you ensure it's in the same grid when you're making changes? Well, don't make changes. Do define it at the very beginning. So it's in the same way that you the the, the quarter point for like a bin. Yeah, that sort of thing. that's that's the thing. Like in saying, you have to have a start point for your BIM model. Well, that's how you that's how you do it. But in the same way, even as the CAD drawn, well, you should do it at the very beginning of the project. It's in the initial scope of works. So, but that has to be carried right through. So when you you build the scope of works for construction, it's already in place. So that contractor, when he comes, he knows exactly what what's in place. It's defined. So uh, it's, it's just something I, I, I always push, like, because there's too many times I've seen, well, the one thing about it, ITM is, is the newer, newer form, and ITM largely moved, removes the scale. Like in Dublin, I think it's only two mil in 100 meters. So the impact of that is very small. Well, if you have a localized site grid, you could only really have, can you only have one point then that is relevant to both the site grid and ITM? No, you can have the whole site. So that's what I mean by transformation. So you can have a, a block shift scale and rotate. So if you take a drawing and you block shift scale and rotate it to, uh, to ITM. So any drawing can be done like that. So, but those parameters have to be calculated. So like use a, well you use a 3D helmet transformation or, or like it's something similar like that. So, so. Uh, capture and attribute data. So capture is in measure. So whether we, we use total stations, um, um, scan data or whatever, and we want to attribute that data and feed it back into model. Stake out, are your tonsors clear? Are your tonsors clear for the certain items for, uh, for construction? Everybody goes, yeah. And we need to set out holding down bolts, but how well do your holding down bolts need to be positioned? Like, are they defined within your, your model? Like, so, something like that. Things like that are very, very good for defining kind of scope of works. Uh, as built in QA. So just looking at the images, so you can see there, they, that's like bringing the model into the field. And they, it, the other, other thing is design. So the TK elements, how do we measure and the design itself? We need to be able to visualize it and articulate it. So is that going to be in full BIM model like we've shown here in the images? Or are you going to give PDFs uh, from, uh, from drawings? So you're going to give CAD drawings, what are you going to give? And uh, obviously a model is better because you can vis visualize what's going on and articulate exactly what the design team wants you to build. That, that, surely that is the key thing. You want to be able to take, the con you want the contractor to be able to visualize what you want to be built. So using 3D information, that's why I always use 3D construction, is because you're visualizing it in 3D, it's more relevant to a real world situation than rather than looking at a 2D plan. I've, I've worked on uh, full BIM jobs, level two BIM jobs. Nobody's been given the model. Everybody gets PDFs. And it's like going backwards to 20 years ago when you, we, before you had CAD on site, you had paper copies on a desk. And that's actually what, it's actually gone backwards for me. So it'd be, we need to be able to push the 3D element. And everybody uses it. How we use that is a different thing. I guess I'll talk to that in a bit. bit. Manage and distribute data and the QA. So that's all kind of part of it. Like, how are you going to manage the data? How are you going to distribute the data? How are you going to scope that out? What is your execution plan? How are you going to QA it? What do you want from the QA procedure? Like all these things kind of build into the scope of works. Like if I, if I sit down on a, in a beam jump to build a job, I want to know what all these things are. So I guess uh, what, how, and where, they're the three things from kind of uh, from a survey point of view, what you want from your model when you're bringing it into the field. What is it? What am I going to get? Am I going to get a full model? Am I going to get setting out points? Am I getting polylines? Am I getting DTMs? Am I getting alignments? What formats are they going to be in? Are they going to be in CSVs, XMLs, MX, GNIO files? What are you going to give me? So how, you, how is that going to be transferred? Because how I build up my workflows dictate, is dictated completely by the format of files. Like uh, looking at the first image there, you can see there that's a, um, that's a pile. 
So on a, on a revenue model, we can insert a point in the centre of all the piles. You might have a job that's got 350 piles on it. How do, I, how, do you, how do you communicate the location of all those points? Well, you can easily just query the model, just output a CSV. There's your all named X, Y, Z. Thank you very much. Load that into your kit. Off you go, setting out. DTMs are obviously important. Um, are we going to be using machine control? Is your contractor using machine control? Have you considered telling them you should use machine control? Like, like is your client into uh, efficiency? What are, they, what are they looking for? Um, and then exactly, like how, how are you going to transfer the data? How is it going to be? like Elements like BIM 360, Autodesk products, there's different products. Technically, have a product as well. Um, you know, have you read this into the scope of works? Telling the contractor how they're going to get this. So at tender stage, they see all this, and then they can price accordingly. Because all these items cost money, basically, to build up infrastructure and workflows to do it. You're going to have the right equipment in place. You're going to have the right uh, software in place. Are you going to need a hub uh, to manage the data on site? You know, these are, these are the kind of things that need to be considered. What is your execution plan? How are you going to take that design and send it to the contractor? How are you going to build it? Generation workflows allows the contractor to build up those workflows. As we were saying earlier on, there's multiple ways you can do it. So con considering how you're going to distribute the data is how you're going to build that workflow. Like every job I've ever worked on, I've worked this, my, I was saying I worked on Lewis, this is my fourth Lewis project and everyone has been different because every way, every, it's always, every job is slightly different. You're essentially building the same thing, but everyone is always different in how your workflows change. Because it's, it's all the way how the, the information is being distributed throughout the job. As I said, is machine control an option for a project? Depending on how you supply the data, machine control can be very easy to use. Do I advocate it? Yes, 100%, 1000%. It's completely the most efficient way to build, build jobs, civil jobs in particular. Why wouldn't you have pavers that can work on their own, uh, uh, machines that can build trenches, that can build slopes without profile board, trenches for pipes on their own, without anyone except the driver knowing where everything is. Full 3D model in his cab, knows where all the clashes are, all the other pipes are, and that information is fed through from the design team. But you can have that, but it's completely dictated by how you're going to do it. A lot of some of the models I've seen, like is, uh, like uh, polylines in in pipes, so you build a three D pipe network or whatever, and your your um, you got electrical your M and E stuff and your drainage, your D D drawings. But they put a polyline on the invert of a of a model pipe, so when it comes to the surveyor, he can remove the the three D to a polyline, which he can select in the field and set out a three D line. You can also query that line, check other clashes against that on site if they come across something that you don't know. Okay, oh, this is this is the image kind of will show you. So, uh, do I have a mouse? Uh, yeah, I do, yeah. So, machine control is uh, the control of machines, uh, plant and machinery on site automatically by either GPS or toll stations. So, um, you can see here, we have machines here being controlled. This is the this is the way I see it kind of moving forward. You would have a centralized hub. So, I, I was laughing with Alan earlier on, I'm sitting in this, hope it is here with the GPS being beamed out directing where everybody's going so uh, you have pavers being laid automatically so there's no pins no stakeout information it's all been done in real time so it's been tracked continuously whether you're using depending on the accuracy so like total station you bring it down sub 5 mil uh, the GPS you'd be looking at kind of 40 50 mil so for artwork stuff like that or even sub ballast like ballast levels and stuff like that getting rough 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 mark like ballast you might get a kilometer done to 20 mil 30 mil in a shift that's pretty good going and then come in and and track a, replace the GPS with prisms and and uh, lash it out in one pass like it's it's it's, it's about as efficient as it gets so using the uh, improved construction quality control so that's what that's that's the main well, why do i see a massive benefit because that is that's what it does it improves our quality control we can manage the data better 
we can uh, electronically distribute data throughout the site, measure and design, back to that measure and design again. So there is in the hub, distributing it to different people on site over a large site without actually having to interact with them. Send it straight to their kit, they get an email, they get a notification that there's an update design, they click on it, load it in, and just start working straight away. Like pavers, um, um, kind of bulldozers, even like, I don't know, even straight down to a, like a 1D, 2D and 3D location. So you could have graders that grade like this, to need to know where they are, the height, the tilt. You could have simple uh, 2D diggers, so, so they, they just know that they, they go in one direction, left and right and straight down, or 1D as in a grader that's just grading at one to two or something like that. So depending on what they're doing, but is this something you should be looking at supplying your data, designing your data, so that your contractor should be using this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a conversation that you should be having with your contractors. Like so. Yeah, it's being used. Yeah, like um, I guess like I've seen a couple uh, instances. Uh, depot has been built a light rail project in Norway where this was heavily used. Like in, in Scandinavia, this is this is the 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 norm. Like um, so. Southern Hemisphere, Australia, it's the norm. It's actually, it does, you see a lot of people coming back from, you probably see a lot of engineers and spares coming back from Australia after spending a couple of years out there. And they're just aghast that nobody uses this. Like, so, like, so uh, we're, uh, again, big open, it's very easy to use, but like, yeah. So, but can you use it in confined places? Yeah, of course you can. Piling rigs, anything, any kind of machinery. I've seen footpaths laid with machine control. So, slip forms. You know. Manage, change, and distribute efficiently. So this is, I guess, again, we're managing that change. So how's the change of the uh, uh, design coming through? And then being able to distribute that efficiently. How do we distribute it efficiently? Well, we can remotely do it to, to, uh, to, to operatives on site. So without any kind of face-to-face -face interaction. Actually, you have a guy on one of the jobs, there were two named John, and uh, two good guys. Both worked for the same uh, company in Australia for four years, never met each other, are working 150 metres away from each other on the job they're on now, still haven't met. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 <laughs> need to get them together. Okay, some more, I kind of, kind of reiterate, bring model to site and build with confidence actually using iPads, tablets, total station, depending on what you do, there's different workflows and way you do it, but what you want to do, you want to build with confidence and accuracy. You are using the right data. You are building it correctly. I am checking that what I'm doing is right. I can see the design data in front of me. Have the answers with you in the field, the ability to query and manage change, drive efficiency and confidence. That's what we want. That's that, surely that is the goal of the overall process, is to drive efficiency. Live on-site check and clash detection as you build and install. So this is kind of more, I suppose, that's kind of more of an M&E kind of thing. We do a lot of M&E work. Uh, so as you can see from the image, doing clashes on pipes, on laterals, stuff like that. So in, say, water treatment plant refits or, or pharmaceutical uh, uh, kind of, uh, or mechanolec kind of chemical plants, kind of clash detection is a big thing. So you have laterals, you have bracing, being able to clash that the pipe is coming through and it's not going to hit something else. Immediate model check and update, and 3D uh, data matches close to real world, only leading to better clarity in sight. Yeah, exactly. For me, to be able to deal with 3D data on site, I can see exactly what's going on. Like you're doing simple road, even into a building, to be able to spinning around in 3D, having DTMs, being able to take points anywhere. That is all do doable once we have the correct design data. I guess, yeah, to lead on to that then is kind of field to BIM. I got, uh, do, do you want me to stop? Does anybody have any questions maybe on that bit? Uh, just waffling on. It, it, well, it, it sometimes it's, it, it doesn't happen until you're on site and for me sometimes that's a bit too late because um, I think 
the execution plan needs to be kind of thought out at least by the consultants at some stage go we are going to supply you data like this and then you would kind of work your workflow around that so uh, sometimes it's like um like i've been in instances where they're going to we have alignment data, like simple road alignment or whatever, or track alignment, and they haven't actually thought out how they were going to supply it. So the formats they were using weren't compatible at all. So they had to go back and redesign, and there was a big delay just because formats weren't correct. So uh, is, that, is that what you're kind of asking? Yeah, so what you're saying is it's best managed through the BIM execution plan. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like it, like I guess it's going to be a cons depending on the contractor as well. It's it's cons they could have their own ideas as well, which they could have their own system in place already lined up. And if they say, well, if you give it to us in this format, that's better. And if it's easy for you to do, then you just uh, you you just work it around that. But the execution plan it has to be has to be taught. What I'm trying to get it has to be taught. It has to be kind of you have to be mindful of it. So like uh, rather than we'll just design it and then we'll worry about how we build it afterwards, like. So uh, I think uh, uh, the elements for giving over survey data or stakeout data has to be included in part of the model process or the design process. As I said, like simple, simple even in a pipe, just having a polyline built into the invert or uh, uh, piles that have a, a node that which you can, you can query and pull up coordinates. It's, only, it's actually only going to help, like so, because you, you have to go back and try and uh, do that information later. Like grid lines for buildings is obviously very easy because everything works off the grid lines. You just need dimensions essentially. But like um, steel and inclined steel or stuff like that for structures or for bridges, uh, arches, kind of different formwork. Like, yeah, like you need to build in the, the stake out there into that. How are you going to build it? Um, if you're building uh, pre cambers into bridges, stuff like that, like all having that kind of stake out information is just massive because there's too many times of. I've had to recalculate it later and then go back to the designer going, is this, is, is this what you meant? Does this work? Like, because they've given us two SOP points and told us there's a pre-camber. So <laughs> build it. <laughs> it's like so. Yeah. yeah, we know the design works. The structural, the structural, uh, uh, structural software says it works. Yeah, so we're happy. So, so, but yeah, you need a bit more information than that. Like so. um, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, how to ensure quality, measure and design again, back to the same thing. So I'm always, like, you measure it and you validate it against the design. So uh, we need to build, take the, what we've staked out, what we've measured and bring it back into the design. Consistency of measured data throughout life cycle only achieved through homogenous control networks, precision, definition and scope. So I've already kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, so the only way you're going to ensure that what is staked out is it a measurement issue is it a build issue or is it a design issue the only way you're going to remove the measurement uh, and uh, out of it is by having one homogenous control network that's consistent over the life cycle of the project because you essentially move that out of it um, like the, the idea that you go oh the coordinate tells me it's here so that has a bit more to it i guess uh, like and when we're taught in college uh, that is the difference between accuracy and precision it's like yes accuracy is something is the difference between what is is known so i know that's a point i can measure it this is the difference between it that's its accuracy but precision is how well we can repeat that measurement how well can we precisely say that that's where it is so i guess the various dealing with statistics a lot that we deal with standard deviations a lot and that's how we define define everything so uh, and the only way you can have that is by having a consistent network throughout the life cycle of project like what makes a good, like what makes a consistent net or sorry set out point then on site just something that's definitely never going to move no not no yeah like uh, yeah like uh, i guess like um uh, i just used the example of project man at the moment uh, uh, we're in t we're basically our site is the city so it's through the city streets so we have control stations on the footpaths but the footpaths are going to get dug up get dug up all the time either by ourselves in the construction or dc could come out anybody come out third party Aircom, we're going to put a, a, put a line of ducts through that footpath and take out all my control stations. So I have to put track into one millimetre. So essentially, so how do I repeat that observation with a new control station? But it's by having essentially a network, what we call a network. So 
in, in your scope of work, so you have to define how good the control network needs to be. And then you should ensure that you have that by having a report so, and, a, and, a, and a critiques, essentially. So uh, the typical kind of, I guess, um, for um, road projects and stuff, or for um, civils, it's like one is to 6,000 linear accuracy. 60,000, sorry, one to 60,000, 6,000. One to 60,000 linear accuracy is typical, so for kind of rail jobs. So it's kind of better than the way you quantify it. It's if you measure 150 meters, that it, it, and you measure any other point in 150 meters, is better than five millimeters. So, so you, you and if you can do that, then you will consistently uh, uh, show it. Now, because measurement isn't a, a defined art, I guess that's why it's sometimes surveyors and engineers clash because we, they say, oh, it's three mil different or five mil different, and we're going, yeah, yeah, it could be. <laughs> so, yeah, so like there is there is no definition. There are so many elements that affect measurement. Uh, but the only way that you can start bringing in and propagating out the errors, as in, you take the error to control, the error to measurement, the error to instrument, and go right. What is the total impact of that? And then the only way you can do that, the largest part of that, is the control network, because the instrumentation you can read a spec of an instrument and it'll tell you how well it'll measure. But uh, it's how you implement that and the survey methods you use to bring that right down into the, the accuracies that you need. So, But for me, what, where should you define this? Well, it should be in your work requirements and scope of works. Uh, what, what do you want? Do you want a full model? Do you want the, the SOP points bounce back at you? Do you want the polylines bounce back? Do you want DTMs bounce back at you? What do you want? What do you want? So again, scoping that out. Like when you're in your QA, QC, so you're bringing your field data back into the BIM, what you actually want to see. Again, like something like, oh, that's 360. If you stake out points, just to use an example, it has a name, you stake it out, you record it, it gives it a, a, a name relative to that and you can bounce that back. If you're setting out, say, say bolts uh, for a column and the bolts are in the wrong place, but you, how do you know there which bolts they are? Well, they'll have a defined name. So you need to have the naming conventions kind of worked out so that you can uh, reiterate that and build it into, into the model. Sure, if they're in the wrong place, but it's still within tolerances and you have to redesign the, the beam, well, then that can be done automatically. And then and the new schedule is done up and that goes back out. So it's having that kind of flow of information just kind of uh, from the beam into the field and back in again. And how fast can that be pushed back out again? Uh, and then they reference some standards like LOD, LOI. Again, of course, I guess Alan's going to talk a bit more about that. <laughs> more detail. So, and how, how do you want it? What's the format you want it in? So, again, just trying to, uh, as we said, all of these elements are kind of a talk on themselves, but it's kind of just to put the thought processes in your head, like uh, what are important, or from a survey point of view, what are important? Like, what would it be the questions if I sat down in a meeting with an engineer talk about BIM what what where and how would be the three questions I'd have and now they would be fleshed out into a, a, a document but they're, they're, that's exactly what I want to know like what are you giving me how are you giving it to me and where do you want it so I've, I've said it what where and how yeah it's, it's just like I keep saying it all the time every job it's like so like how are you giving me the name? Why are you giving me? How am I? And where do you want? Uh, and where is it going to be stored? And uh, and and the same goes back. What do you want? How do you want it? And where do you want me to put it? Like how is the transfer of data infrastructure to be built up with insights? Like where is the data going to be stored? How is it going to be transferred? Like do you does your contractor have in place this infrastructure? I guess fastener is as built. So um, I guess for like for us, being able to do a survey, what survey offer you, what this, being able to as built quickly as you go. So a couple of things there, you can see see a total station measuring some pipes. Uh, this is mobile mapping on the right hand side, and then uh, uh, this is a scan data, but on a backpack. So essentially walking through a building, picking up scan data as he walks. So so measure model hundreds. Of as I said, improve safety uh, uh, by say, um, uh, mobile mapping, 
more accurate updates on uh, project status. So what is the status of your project? Where are we are percentage of your completion? Building up as built as you go, and forming that, building that back into BIM gives accurate data of where we are in a project. And that's surely that's what we want. Um, most project managers won't really care about BIM or how you model, but they want to know how well the project's going. And they, feeding that information, having that cycle of feeding back information all the time will give you kind of clear understanding where everything is, how well everything's built, where are we are at construction stage, how are we doing. Office-based models for data quickly. Yeah, having a data transfer, online data transfer, as we talked about earlier on, being able to send data electronically from the field to the site and back, or from the site office to the field and from the, uh, the field to the site office. I saw something recently, it was a, it was a quote in was some American thing. They said that most, the biggest spend for technology uh, is in the office. It's something like 90% on construction sites which is, seems very high, where I guess the idea of this is that you, you take that technology more into the field. Take, take it with you, bring it out into the field, have that information with you, make the decisions. Like if it's even simple pads with Navis works, so you can draw sections on, how does this image interact with a retaining wall? Draw the section there and then see how it looks. Now we know, it. now we can make an informed decision. It doesn't necessarily, always be about survey or how well you can position things but it's more about clarity and 3d data than forming yourself on site overall reduction of qa qc and modeling hours exactly yeah so like that's what you want surely that's the goal I guess this is a kind of a look at some of the kind of data we would do. So a point cloud survey data, scan, true, scan image, true, true views kind of is a, like a specific term. Uh, and then a kind of final model, being able to, uh, once you have your models built up and your family's built up, you can just snap to the point cloud and build up accurate as built data. But I guess Alan's going to kind of talk a bit more about that. Yes, he is. <laughs> so, right, so uh, I guess, uh, does anybody have any questions? I don't know. That's a that's a tricky question. <laughs> so, well, I guess uh, this this is the thing. I suppose for me, is uh, you need to get away from ownership of data. Nobody owns the data. It's a construction project. We're all in to build it together. Like so, um, is survey relevant data? It's just a, uh, it's 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 whether I suppose I guess it's whether you want to know if it's if it's if to be part of the QAQC. Is the onus going to be on the contractor to, for the QAQC, or are the client and the consultant going to be involved in the QAQC element? If you're just going to design it, give it to con con contractor and they QAQC themselves and they prove it at the end of the job, well then that's that's their prerogative. So it's just whether you're involved in that process, well then you're into that kind of thing. So if the consultant is part of the QAQC process, well then it's a shared information. But then that model needs to be shared throughout. So if, uh, if there's gonna be changes in design during the process, well then it's important that then everybody's involved in the process. Everybody sees the same information. It has to be, it falls down completely if, if that's not the case. Like, I don't, I like, uh, the, the idea is then you're back to again making model distributing CAD drawings and PDFs and you're back to what we were doing kind of 15 20 years ago so the whole idea is that that information is quickly fed in and for everybody else, everybody's notified how are you going to do how is it going to work is how you define the workflows like alerts you know who has access to information having those defined scopes in part of the works requirements they're all the things that need to be fleshed out as part of the works. So, like, ownership of data, it's not something, it's not really kind of part of it, it's actually who has access to it and who has, who can make the changes, I suppose. Everybody has ownership of the data. Yeah. It's like, uh, I suppose, in the old days, it would be the yellow survey book that you would have, and at the end of the job, they get put into a box and they get stored for 15 years or whatever it is for the life cycle of the project. And it's the same kind of thing. The information is passed back and forth. Like it depends on the in the contract. Really, is it design and build? Uh, like what is it? What's the scope? I just 
Assets. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, that has to be part of it. But what is the scope? Is is that is that asset BIM deliverable part of the initial works of scope? If it is, well then of course it does. But that has to be defined at the beginning. I guess that's how it did. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Exactly. How, uh, what? It, what is the end result? What does the contract have to deliver at the end of the thing? He has to deliver it a full ASCON kind of BIM model. Like yes. And it, but that process during the life cycle of the project is that something that just happens at the end or should it just happen as you're going well surely it should happen as you're going because you get a better understanding what's going on so you can build it up because is any a contractor at the end of a job just going to go right that we are going to build this bin model because it says here in the works requirement section 3.2 that we have to or they, if you do it as part of the overall process during the life cycle of the project it's you're going to end up with a better a better uh, product What do you mean, sorry? Yeah, but like in mid contract kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. well, for you could still, yeah, yeah. For, retrofitting. for retrofitting. Yeah, well, you could still, yeah, like the, but that's like would be specific works requirements for that then. Like, so you would say, like, well, well, this is a new scope, this is what you need to do, defining that scope, and then for, for them to do that. Like, it, retrofitting something or it's the same as the beginning I guess we talked about it initially I know you guys missed the initial part of it no no it's, it's, it's fine like it, it's capture rent like say you have an existing building it, we're going to refit this building that you would go in like uh, model it and build up the assets of it that would be the same kind of thing so it'd be initial if you want to do that and then design based on that and then construct build up the assets and then uh, and then deliver. But I guess Alan's going to go into kind of he's going to Alan's going to take over, uh, kind of on the asset kind of thing. So you might have more specific questions for that. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. To to some degree, yes. Like where a uh, survey information would be fed back to the uh, to the design team, and they would they would. Yes. Yes. Yeah, but you have you have that yes, but you have that in design. Yeah, but I suppose like you would still have that even if you give a, a Genio file or an MX file, you could still have that issue. Like you know, like that 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 issue has never has always been there. Like, but you can still make mockups on PDFs. Still. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone last week two hundred mil off two two sections on the same PDF of a floor level like so uh, like it's, it's easily done it's easily done but like you know like it's still it's it's still seen on 3d cad drawings that were passed around and people didn't seem to have a problem passing that around i guess uh, uh, it is all about that shared information and uh, uh, and i think like it only works if we get over those kind of uh, those worries like maybe you build something into the contract like so Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess that, uh, and, and 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 I guess that that is the is risk is the big word, uh, and uh, and clar uh, what reduces risk clarity, like so. Uh, for me, from survey point of view, having clear three D data reduces the risk. Yeah, having a, a, a proper QA QC process uh, uh, implements that that workflow that you've generated, and all it does is ensure what you.
what you've decided to go and do is is correct and you reduce that risk massively like so but having the right processes the right workflows the right information laid out on how it's supposed to be done is in, extremely important to be able to generate those correct workflows so okay yeah right I'm not going to talk for anymore, so thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. How can this be? Actually, just to take that point on as well, I mean, I suppose um, the purely BIM side, yeah, I mean, what we've tended to see is from the scan data point of view, we've tended to hold the liability from the model point of view. Once the model gets handed over, it's tended to be the client. That's tended to be the process up to now. Um, dif different projects have had different requirements, but that seems to have been the, the sort of status quo up to now. I mean, and what they do in the UK then is another ball game. They have much more, I suppose, uniformity on how they do these things, especially along the the, the mandates and in terms of CIC being protocols, things like that. It's not. We haven't worked. I think on a single job where any client has mentioned using something like that. Um, it has been purely project to project. Yeah, project, project yeah. um, I'd be much more for uniformity, um, a much more collaborative approach whereby for asset management, who owns the data then? Once a project is handed over, who owns the data? Um, but yeah, the process to now is we, we, we've tended to own the, the survey data itself. The model is a production from the survey data. So that product has been given to the client then. And if there was any, any issues around that, it goes back to referencing and ensuring that our own scan data is correct, and then making deliverables from that. So we would see models as products from the scan data, and we've tended to hold that liability. Um, I hope that kind of clears up some of that to know. Um, but again, I think this, it's an evolving process here. I don't think it's going to go exactly the same as the UK. Um, a lot of companies are trying to follow that, other companies don't want to. We're going to end up in the short term, I think, somewhere where companies are trying to follow that um, and others are kind of left out of the loop. But until something is clear, I think there's going to be this little grey area. And I think a lot of companies are still put off by that. Um, so I think unless there's more questions, I'll, <laughs> I'll push on. Um, but yeah, in terms of the odd thing, I mean, Michael's touched on this quite a lot in terms of how we use this data on site and um, capability of ver verifying models. That for us, that's, that's what we want to see is that we're not just spending time sending guys out on sites, taking measurements, coming back, doing products from that, issuing it, time wasted then in the actual process of doing that um, and then for comments to come down and then for guys to go back out to check it, even though the data should have been there in the first place. Um, for us, going on site with all your information, um, making queries, making comments, making edits on site, then notifying those queries and edits straight away for us is a huge thing. Um, I think that's the kind of process and workflow, that's the kind of thing that we want to see all our guys do on sites. They're bringing their own information with them on a site and to be able to query everything, and they will act as, I suppose, data managers, essentially, on sites, rather than just simply going out and the time, I mean, it, it can be days, it can be weeks by the time, information is fed back to a client. Um, we want to speed that up, and there's plenty of kits, plenty of software, plenty of hardware that enables us to do that. But again, it's, it's not going to be used until it's specified or there's a requirement um, and I'm not talking about specifying down to the level of you know, the actual hardware specifications, but specifying things like that type of a process, specifying that you want um, auditing of files, you want to have that ability on site, and allowing for that, I think, is a big thing. I don't think a lot of projects would push that, except for the large ones, yeah. if that's not in place. Um, and I think that's where we see it in the, in, in the long run. But um, again, this is what it allows us to do. I think that, that's only going to help every project, no matter how small, no matter how long, and it doesn't matter how small a project is, the same problems appear on every single work site, and it's always around what is the correct information, and how fast can that be um, issued to another stakeholder. 
they are, they, it comes up everywhere, and it doesn't matter how big your project or how small your project is, that's what it is. And this, I suppose, the stuff that we bring now is that we can speed that up. Um, projects can become much tighter, much smaller. That helps costs. That can only help everybody. Um, but it has to be specified, it has to be allowed for it, it has to be mentioned before these projects start. A lot of it is only mentioned when the project starts, between contractors and between personnel on site. And then data gets delivered, and then there's queries that come back, well, how about we, we do it this way? Could you provide this? If that's not specified at the very, very start of a project, then we don't build that in. We don't allow time for it, and we don't process things. We can process things a different way if we know what the likely outcome of the information is or where it's going. Um, what the intended use of a model is, for instance. Very, very simple things. Do you want the model to be a visual record and you don't care what's in it? Do you want it to be just a 3D CAD model? Do you want just simply to get a couple of plans and sections and take measurements on critical beams? If that's all you want and you're not prepared to wait for a model that might take weeks, then specify that to us. We, have, you know, we can process the same information that's taken on site but give you those specific, specific information requirements um, to contractors, to clients, at pre-deliverable stages. But if it's not allowed for, it slows everything down. Um, and the more, the more questions we receive, I think, at, at that stage, really, it helps us. The more we know what a client wants out of a project, or if they know that they have contractors on site, they have certain guys coming in in a week's time and they need certain bits of information, then we can provide all that right before we provide a model, or right before we provide plans and sections. Um, that's the other thing then, like taking a model and then specifying a whole load of 2D requirements out of that, um, but just want a model. That's, that's happened on a lot of jobs. Um, a model can be anything. It can be anything in the world to anybody. Um, we've got to get rid of that. We've got to, like, our most successful projects are projects, large projects that had very well equipped specifications and execution plans attached to them. That's where we've done our best work under time, under budget. It's the jobs where nothing is specified, just a one line, or we need a model. That's the stuff that runs out, essentially. And we end up over modeling or over producing something when we don't have to at all. Um, yeah, it's not very cost efficient for the end user no. either. So. No, and they get a whole a massive file of data they don't need either, as well as an archive that's just going to be thrown into another room which they could have thrown the CAD, the CAD drawings into anyway. So, um, again, just simple things in terms of auditing this data, um, clash identification, m and &E guys on site, staged fit-outs. Um, we're trying to get away from, I suppose, a lot of this clutter. What we see, what we've done on jobs is to do staged scans. Um, we can do scans very, very quickly. We can do them at different stages multiple intervals in a job and we can use these scans just simply to check locations if needs be as well. We can verify, like your set of points, we can verify critical positions of critical items, um, scan it, tag it afterwards, verify that it's correct as per the design and then we can move on and the installers come on site and do another run of ducks around that. We can come in, scan it, make sure that's correct speed of the process, we can scan it very, very quickly, and we can verify it very, very quickly, the information that's there, and then you move on to the next step. Rather than doing everything in one go, guys out, not sure which pipes should be where, what's been confirmed, who knows what on site is a big thing. Um, once things are clearly identified and labelled and staged, we can do a lot of things. Um, but again, it has to be set out, it has to be allowed for, it has to be spoken about and thought about before the guys are on site. And this is what happens all too often. Um, from an asset management point of view, there's a whole heap of types of projects that we've worked on. Um, any kind of project, I could go on high street, industrial, a whole variety of them. Um, and again, the types of models that, that we produce, um, that's, that's coming down to specifications for us. Um, we get specifications whereby all that's sort of critical is the planned position of something. We end up building something in a really old, building a model from a very old building. Um, you are guaranteed to have a massive variance between the CAD data, no matter how it's been done, and a scan file. Um, how do you want it? Do you, like, what's important to a client? Is it just simply the planned position? 
Is it the vertical leaning of something? If that's not important, we should know that beforehand because if we have a scan file that shows sagging and leaning, and you'd be surprised how much there is um, in every project, um, we will end up over modeling. And if we don't, then um, it's a case of trying to be generic, trying to help performance of files, but we need to know that what's important to the client is, is a few CAD sections versus a spatial model so that they can understand a space. Is that more important or is one model with every single thing, every nut and bolt in the exact position it should be, is that important? Or is a model whereby you can understand the space, use it very, very quickly, get other products and deliverables from it, use it for marketing purposes whereby the accuracy may not be so critical, but then you might just require a couple of sections that could be done in CAD. Like, it depends on what the client actually wants out of a project. There's a huge variance. Every single project we've worked on has a different set of requirements for a different set of needs by different sets of clients. Um, but we need to know that. We need to know what is the intended use of this stuff and where is it likely to be going, because that informs us how we build a model and what's critical. And it also informs us that we don't need to spend time doing a whole model, because for us, we may have our own process in terms of what stages we build a model at. Um, for some clients, they may require a lift core, two lift cores, to be the first stage of plan information, and then they may worry about the rest of it afterwards. That for us then informs us that we can build a model in certain areas and then produce information from that. Because as it is, you can be a while waiting for a model, but different contractors want different information. And it comes down to, again, who needs what, who wants what, and what do we need to provide? Because um, we can provide a lot of different types of information. Um, and again, everything down to bespoke parameters, survey comments, some of the simple things that we do, I suppose, from a BIM point of view versus a CAD point of view. If it's purely visual, we can provide 3D modeling software to give you an ultra accurate model that has limited intelligence, or we can provide a model that's highly functional, that's highly parametric, that has comments, has a lot of information attached to it, um, that might be important to another client down the line, tracking items rather than knowing the millimeter position of something. But we need to know what exactly is required out of these things. Um, descriptions of tags, I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do with it, but once a client knows what they want out of it, then we can provide it. And again, it informs the more we know and the more we put into a model um, for clients' needs, it informs that integration for asset and FM down the line. I mean, I just threw in there, Kobe and IFC, it's, it's something we've done in projects in England. We haven't done them here, we've done IFC here. There's a lot of talk about Kobe, different circles here, but we haven't worked on a project yet where Kobe was, was even mentioned. Um, but we see it a lot in presentations, and we see it a lot in other seminars. A lot of people are talking about it, but unless you're on a project in England at the moment, it doesn't even come into the fray. But these things do need to be thought about. What do you actually want out of a project? Because we can provide these different things. It's just a case of specifying from the very, very start in an execution plan um, how we do asset management as well. Um, as built to BIM, lots of var various ways we can mean, strapping these things on top of cars, um, mobile mapping. The amount of information we can get and the speed that we can get it is times and it's only getting better and better and um, we've got a whole new UAV division dedicated to large-scale um, information now as well and you'd be surprised at the type of information how fast you can get it but it's coming down to storage and capacity the other element is that do we hold that data and just provide you with um, information that's shared a lot of people forget that we don't have to give you a hard drive full of everything we can share it online, we can give you a web access where you can view and use the information without handling any of the data. And very few projects require it. They all want us to just archive it and send it on to them. But f for what need? It, it, it can be used, but it isn't being used. Um, there's a whole load of different ways. I mean, you mentioned Autodesk 360, Glue, there's lots of different. There's Recap 360, we can share scans, true views. Lots of different ways that we can send you a whole scan file. Um, we can scan a place very, very quickly, a few days processing, and we can share a whole scan file with a client who can then, like this, dimension around like in Street View, 
in a bubble view, they can dimension, they can do various things with it, they can see all the that we've taken on site without handling any of the data if they choose. Um, there's lots of different ways we can do this. Yeah, well, uh, just to jump in on the mobile yep. map, and one of the big things would be motorways for, um, it, well, I've seen it for, for, say, painted lines. So a lot of agencies would have to do refit of painted lines, so there's damage or cracks in surfaces or like that. How would they investigate? Well, they'd have to go out and physically drive and look around it and everywhere to go, where some of the uh, jobs we've done where we've uh, driven, the, driven the roads with a mobile mapping system, and for an hour you can drive the road, you pick up a million points a second, and you can pull essentially the serial number off a pole and look at the road type, look at the cracks in the road and build and then tag everything in the system and build up your database based on, on, on what your works are going to do. Then query your database, what are the core things that we need to prioritise, maybe one to five, right, what are five things we need, where are the five elements that we need to, uh, we need to uh, tackle now straight away. And then it brings up the list of jobs and then you build your plans based on that. Quantify it, assign a value, build up budgets, you know, from simple data. Like. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things we can do, yeah. lots of ways we can do it. Yeah, and I mean, I, I suppose what we see is that we can get data very quickly. And what we would see is that down the line that we, again, different contractors, different clients require different data sets and we can provide different elements from the same data set um, and again taking a scan for instance I mean we've got plenty of software to just trace over scans to to give you the critical 3d dimensions of, of beams of soffits push it out to one client they can pass it on uh, while we're waiting for information you know use that information to pass on to another uh, contractor to the stuff that they need there's lots of different ways we can provide this information from the very very same data set which is what we're you know, you don't have to get this whole lump and then decipher it yourself. And again, efficiencies and cost effectiveness, you know, don't even have to say more on that. I mean, we can get it very, very quickly. Um, generation of mapping models and detailed asset databases. Again, some projects from an asset management point of view, I've just put in a little bit to the right there. Um, Again, recording the true sagging nature of surfaces in multiple planes. How is that being done? What does the client want? Um, does the client want a model that shows all of this information? Does the client want it modeled this way? Does the client want it more generic than that? We can put in generic items, but then tag it to describe. That kind of a workflow will keep the file size down, and the file size does bloat out pretty quickly if you over model the stuff. Um, and a project that size it can be huge, and then your IFC translations from that can be massive. The more customization you do to these models as well, you put that through an IFC translation, and you can end up with three or four, five times, six times the size of your original model, and um, depending on how much you put into that model. Um, but if you model it pretty simply, but attach comments and queries, and attach survey comments, put in deviation numbers where you can put out a schedule to say and show you where the deviations are how many there is in total, put a 3D view on this to, sh to highlight all the deviated elements. Is that more effective for a client than modeling everything? And then it has to be sectioned, cut, and then found out. So what is the true nature of this model? I mean, is, is it a case that we do just do a simple model, but then put in, put in text and put in information to highlight um, differences and deviations? There's lots of ways we can do this. and It doesn't have to be a case that we want everything modeled as is, because when it comes to some of this stuff, especially in heritage projects, it's very, very, very complicated to, to model as is in every single dimension. I think people forget sometimes that it's not a case of one or two sections that you want ultra accurate. It's every single infinite plane you want that's accurate. So what's more important to show? Is it the main deviation, the main camber in a beam, and then other elements to show um, or other parameters to show where there's minor deviations but that all has to be built in from the start to allow us to do that um, I suppose awareness of how a model is being built because we can't just always produce this this model and then have a sit down afterwards when some people are very happy with it some people aren't happy with it when we could have had a whole different workflow and a whole different process if we knew from the start and um, what is being done with the model um, 
And again, model accuracy versus performance. What's the key criteria in the production of a model? That has to be thought about because it does bloat out pretty quickly. What, uh, what kind of file size is it typically? Typically, the projects we work on, like that project there could run up to anything like, like you'd want that split. That will be split into probably four or five sections. Each one could be anywhere from 50 to 100 megs. So, I mean, if you take out, um, I suppose, millimeter accuracy in, in, in doing every single sag and every single vertical and horizontal deviation, we can then bring that out a quarter of the size, but then just attach comments to the elements to show or say where deviations are and to highlight it in a 3D view, for instance. Put them all on a different color in a different 3D view. Very, very easily done, just as effective, but it depends on who's dealing with it. If they're aware of how to use this information or where the information is, it makes our life easier and we can keep model files down and sizes down as well. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no point asking for it if it's going to be an external hard drive in your drawer, yeah. in your desk, because you can't even open it. Like, yeah. Because the file size is too big, because you don't have the infrastructure to even look at it. But even on that, I mean, if you don't want to deal with the software at all, I mean, we can share all these models through the likes of Autodesk Suites and A360, where you get the, the model. You can section, you can cut it, do your own sections, you can look at the model parameters, the information. You can have access to all that information that we put into a model, but you you, you don't have to deal with the software side of it. It's just a link in a browser. So we don't have to give you the model on a hard drive if you don't want it. And it depends on what you want out of it. When we, when we know that, we can offer that as, as an alternative as well. And again, heritage recording, um, tricky sites. All these images on the bottom are point cloud images. Um, we get scan images then we also get panoramic images taken from those scanners as well. So there's a variety of deliverables we can produce um, from sites as well, from panoramic images um, and scan data. But the scan data can be really, really good. There, you, you don't even need those images. Um, but it depends on what the outcome is, who's going to use the data and use it all. Um, but we do tend to see scanning on tricky sites. Um, but it comes back to establishing scopes of works. Um, it's critically important, um, and the more fleshed out this stuff is at the start, the more we can deal with it, and the quicker we can move on with it as well. Um, and again, critical elements, levels of detail requirements. Um, and Michael said I was going to touch on it, and I suppose one of the things we want to see again, what's the frame of reference and what's the standard being used on a BIM project? Is it going to be PAS 1192 for a BIM project? Is it going to be something else? Is it just going to be a client's own standard specification? Um, we see very little projects that actually specify whether it's a PAS 1192 um, project, but they often want that type of level of detail or that type of requirement, but they just don't specify it. Um, so it, it, it's a huge query at the moment. Every single project we, we've worked on has different requirements and they come in different forms. I think we prefer, if it's a BIM job, to just make it clear what the references are, make it clear what you want out of it. Um, for us, it would be very easy if every job we had just said PAS 1192, this level of detail, this is the reference, um, and this is what we want out of it. That's, that's perfect for me, but we don't even get that on, on most jobs. Um, and it can be hard just dealing back and forth with different clients. And you get there in the end, but sometimes it doesn't have to be such I don't know the word I'm going to use, but it, yeah, <laughs> difficult. Yeah. It's the same, yeah. the same with the construction process like as well, because like, he, whether it's at the beginning of the capture or the asset chain, it's the overall process. It has to be just thought out completely from the beginning. What do you want? Like, how do you want it? And, where do you want and it? if you don't know, like, we can have a, a talk yes. about it beforehand and we can go through these processes. It doesn't have to be that you, do, you have to know everything about the process. That's not the case, but we can have all these discussions beforehand and then you can develop and inform your own process around that. Um, and it can be quite a quick thing, but it has to be thought about before the process begins, really. Um, or you will run into a bottleneck, yeah. essentially, or something will be missed or over-designed. If, uh, if you over-design something, you're gonna to pay too much for something that you don't actually need. Can you be more efficient? Surely yeah. the process, again, is that more efficient in the construction and building of it. But if you're not efficient in actually processing the data and delivering the results, well then you're kind of you're losing out again because you're, you're costing too much on yourself. 
And, th and then again, what will happen, you'll be frustrated with the, the system and the process and you'll just kind of back away from it, like so, which, is, which is not the goal here, because we know it works. Yeah, and we, we know it does work, and that's the, the key with it. Um, again, how, it affects everything, it affects models, how we input data, how we record heritage features, and it comes down to speed versus information quality. If you want all this stuff in it, tell us, but it will take a hit on the speed of it. On the other side, if you don't need that stuff, tell us that you don't need it, and we can do these things quicker as well. Um, and again, in reference to standards, we have standards and standards, there's lots of standards. Um, they're a lot more unified now than they were in the last couple of years. Um, saying things like what's the LOD and what's the LOI and what's the level of information what's the level of detail on this stuff um, how do we model it or can we just put information into the model um, information in the model is very, very easy extracted um, it's just as effective it just depends on who's using it who wants to use it um, and again it, it stops file bloating um, but it depends on what's what's required out of it um, and the use of TrueViews, Recap360, there's lots of different web share applications um, that we can send survey information out to clients, out to contractors very, very quickly. They can view all of it very, very quickly through a web browser or an app on a mobile um, tablet. There's lots of ways. Um, they don't have to wait for a lot of this information. Yeah, let me say we'll skip through this one. Yeah, we'll quick time. time yeah. anyway. And again, what are standard BIM projects for us? Um, we've worked on a variety of them. Um, one retail chain, um, lots of models done, but they're across Ireland, UK and Germany. Um, we've taken a standardised approach whereby we model, um, I suppose it's quite a short timeline, but they want it for um, very, very simple layout models for clients. They will then do their marketing around it. They'll do their furniture layouts. They'll Different um, marketing opportunities for that, space layouts, um, tracking their own, I suppose, inventory essentially is what they want out of it. Um, they supply furniture layouts, we put the furniture items into some of these scans, we have the scan data to show what everything is and where everything is, um, and then we can fit their own furniture components to these elements. There's lots of ways that we work with different clients um, on their projects, um, and it's not always just from an architectural and structural point of view. Um, yeah, some it, of them were a lot of them were dealing with scan, so we did it more actually. But yeah. we're still able to build a model from it because of the, the, the well defined scope that they had. Like so. Yeah. And I mean what they wanted out of it was again um mid range tolerances, but what they wanted was flexibility. They wanted models so that they can quickly see relevant information, quickly extract relevant information and then use it quickly um, to inform them how they want to change their stores. Um but allowed us to build these things quickly and to do surveys, whether it's lanes, whether it's toll stations, and we can do them quite quickly as well. Um, store product data integration, I mean, I mentioned it already, it's multi-purpose, what they want out of it. Some general comments, again, I've touched on it. Um, clients having their own specifications and level of detail requirements. Uh, we need to be thorough and specific about specifications. Um, some clients reference, they say level two BIM, some clients aren't referencing level two BIM in the UK. They're referencing an LOD 200 or an LOD 2, depending on different frameworks. They're not referencing the same LODs, but they just write down one, a one liner, we want a level two model. We need to be clear, I suppose, on what is, what level of detail are being referenced, um, from what documents are being referenced from, um, or samples um, to be sent so that we know we're on the same page because there's a lot of projects that have the exact same LOD requirement, but from different perspectives. Um, for us, we tend to probably model it more on um, the BIM forum, LOD specifications 2015, from LOD 100 to 500 would be that specification. If it's not that specification, um, please tell us, because it just it slows down everything when someone just says a level whatever, but they don't tell us what they're referencing, and then we have to go back it can take days to clear this up in terms of what has been referenced. Um, but yeah, models, um, their spatial and data tools, CAD information has to be tweaked then additionally. 
what is the purpose of a model? Is the model just being used to extract CAD information? Is the model being used to do analysis on? Um, they're two different things. If, if it's just CAD information, then it needs to be specified because we will set up our models differently then if we know that there's only certain sections um, that are critical, certain sections that aren't critical. Um, we just need to know this because it affects everything. Tolerances, um, and again, lines versus objects. Is everything modelled or can annotation work for some elements? It's often a case where we model structural and architectural features and then when it comes to plant elements, it might just be main volumes that are important. Um, once that's set out, and we can clear in what we're doing. Sometimes it's a case of we want all the MEP, but all the MEP inside in a scan file can be phenomenal, and it depends on whether this ceiling here is present or what stage of construction we're at. If it's a retrofit, if that ceiling's been taken down and we weren't aware of it, and then we went on site and scanned everything, and now every single plant element and every single MEP element was well, that's hugely going to bloat out what we're going to model. And we've been on projects where this stuff wasn't known beforehand um, and we weren't able to quote due to site access issues. And then we got on site and found out that our quote was massively underwhelmed due to the extra information that was now present. Um, but then once we, we tell someone what the cost of doing it is, they very, very quickly say, no, we don't need it. So this happens a lot. Um, what is the requirement on a job needs to be set out from the very, very start. Um, and again, yeah, does annotation work? Because we can do that as well. Very, very simple. Simple modeling using generic Revit families where possible. And it doesn't have to be Revit. It could be Revit, Archicad, SketchUp, whatever the application is, um, we need to know um, beforehand. But just in terms of as built BIM, again, utility conundrums. You can see there's a lot of information there. Um, making sense of it can be problematic. But again, we can help out there whereby it's not just handed over. Critical lines, critical paths, critical elements can be set up very, very quickly. We can do that prior to, to issuing information if it's required. And then it speeds up down the line, people going through model files and trying to track the stuff themselves. It just depends on what's required out of it because we can do a lot of it for you. How is BIM data displayed? A variety of ways. You've got geometry and or data within the environment. Is geometry important only? Is data important or is both? Um, 3D views, 2D views, schedules. A lot of the, the stuff I suppose below the 2D views, um, the schedules, properties, parameters, phase and disciplines, none of it is really specified in a lot of the jobs. Some of them it is, a lot of it. Um, there's no discussion about that. But it's important to us, we will always issue out files that, that are correct phases, that have basic properties and parameters as per LOD requirements. Um, but if there's a custom version of this or something that you want differently on it, tell us beforehand because we can do it. We can do that. Custom phases and um, put in custom parameters if something's in, important, if something wants to be tagged, um, we can do that beforehand and it's not giving you a whole dump of information. Um, controls and filters very, very easily done. Um, and again, benefits of BIM projects. There's just a couple of slides up, up around there, but very, very quick. Um, traditional 2D information as well as 3D spatial information. Um, there can be extensive material thermal data built in. This comes in a lot of different forms. Um, in very, very basic information. Um, it can be down to just the, the basic material type that can be useful. Um, Physical information comes along with that anyway. So once we put in something very, very simple, like it's concrete or, or whatever it is, you get basic physical properties behind it anyway. Um, but knowing it's there and knowing that it's either generic or that specific can be massively helpful to different clients. We can, we can build models that have more specific information in it, if that's the requirement, or we can put it in so that it's just general for general analysis, but knowing the material types is important. We can do all that beforehand um, once it's specified, because if it isn't specified, we're going to survey it, see, see the surfaces, um, and build the stuff generic. So it'll all be a generic material. But if it's important to, to just paint a surface for visual purposes, or if it's important to have the actual physical properties behind it, then we need to know that, because we can do it quite quickly, but it's harder done at the end of a project than it is at the start. If we know that the properties behind it are important, then we'll do that. It's not a problem. 
um, to reports, manuals and links from outside sources to the model again we can do all this stuff with information um, and the point for the asset side of it is that it's a single source information we can combine our information to one file I mean from a coordination point of view getting our scan data located in the same file we'll do that um, putting the 2D information in, into the file that will be located in the same place depending on the coordinate system again um, and the model information all the information that we provide will be located correctly so that there's not 20 million different bits of information lying around that has to be coordinated by somebody else um, we're trying to avoid the no boxes of drawings <laughs> essentially, um, or crates of drawings as it is at handover for a lot of projects. Um, again, what do you get out of it? As built in existing structural conditions, um, very, very simply, I mean, that, that image in the middle is just to show a model column with the green as a point cloud up against it. So we can very, very visually quickly identify the positioning of information. And it can come down to just that. It can come down to just literally a screen clip with a report attached to it. Um, it can come down to just a subsection of a model or a subcategory of a model if it's just that information that's needed and then we can verify with point cloud information in 3D views showing you that it's correct um, there's lots of different ways we can verify and QA this stuff and we can provide that as well um, and again some very very quickly uh, there's perspective shots thrown in there but it's, it's mainly to identify just that we can do a lot um, on a project from the same information um, from a fit out point of view um, or from a structural analysis point of view exporting this information then to other analysis packages like Robot and Lucis there's plenty of white papers on the integrations um, with various BIM um, applications to their softwares and we can do that from the start as well if that kind of job we can survey it we can extract information from that point cloud we can put it into a model um, for further analysis once that's deemed the critical element on it we can do that Topography, I mean, there's a million ways we can do that now. It's not simply a native element. Um, what's important to a client? Is it just to see visually in a section that everything is where it should be? Do they want material properties out of that? Um, do they want to drop their own levels on top of that? Um, there's a lot of different ways between doing something in a native BIM package and doing it in another package and bringing it into a, native, into a, a BIM application. We can do it quickly using a variety of, of, of softwares. But sometimes we get a specification where it says a native topographic element. Um, but for us, that can be quite slow to do. Um, we can model it in other applications, like if we have a survey using Civil 3D, for instance. If, if, if that terrain is already done, we can bring that very, very quickly into a Revit model without having, again, more modelers having to come up with this information and, and produce it from that. We can just bring it in by using some custom workflows that we use on these things. Um, without having to spend the extra time producing it. Um, it'll be essentially a hybrid, but it, it's, it's fully functional within BIM environments. It allows that graphic on the right. I mean, if that's all that's needed out of, out of a cut section on topography, there's a lot of different ways we can do it um, that do enable dropping of tags and dropping of spot levels on our topographies. Um, yeah, I mean, using a variety of softwares that I've touched on. And again, the future, it's not really the future, it's there now, but it's not really specified on a lot of jobs here. Some jobs specify it, um, but that's essentially what you're getting um, in a web shared environment. You're getting a full view of what's been scanned, um, you're getting information using hot links. Um, we can put in serial numbers if for asset management. There's plenty of things we can attach to um, images and to scan data and it can be shared all online um, to a client. Yeah, the, biggest, the biggest cost uh, is putting somebody on site. Yeah. So that, that's the number one cost. It's the biggest overhead. If you do not specify that, getting it later could act because you have to go revisit a site to build up assets. So having it spec in the beginning will only save on cost. And it'll only uh, improve quotes from ourselves like it because it's a one visit scan it is scan data and the image in is that it is one single visit yeah. to pick up absolutely everything so uh, but the better spec that it is the more information you have like tracing tracing pipes through uh through um, um up through buildings or something like that, that you want to know where where an electrical duct goes 
well, somebody on site can actually trace that duct and find out where it goes, and that can be tagged into the model and so forth, which is what we've done that many times. Yeah. I mean, you, using that single visit, essentially, if it's the case that one deliverable is, is something like this, it might be a different deliverable in three months' time for the same client out of the same data set. And we can do that then without going back on site because we have the information already. But we can produce it in different formats and different ways for clients with different end goals out of this at the end of the day um, without going back on site. Again, it can be included in the final bin model. Um, but currently, whose responsibility is it to gather this information and include it in an as-built model? Setting out the responsibilities, who's to get this information if it's required, um, and just being present in it, um, whether it's there or not, is, is important to us. Um, if it's specified, we can produce it. If it's not specified, then it'll just sit there. And it's a case that we have the information already on a lot of projects, but if we don't know or it's not specified um, to put the stuff in, it's useless because then it just sits there and then years down the line or months down the line something else another project happens we get more data and discover that the data is the same as the data we've already got um, it's a case of knowing what you want out of it and knowing what we can provide um, at the end of the day again interoperability um, it's just literally it's a list um, try not to spend too long on it but it's just a bunch of buzzwords up there um, but again it does it I think it conveys the fact that there's a lot of things that we can do out of the very same data set we use software to for mobile mapping for UAV for for looking at massive data sets quickly and um, there's other software we use for setting out from the same data set and um, lots of uses and um, translating to other BIM softwares um, but it has to be specified again as delivered from the start because it won't get done otherwise. Um, CAD to BIM, BIM to CAD, what is the end goal of a model? Um, is it asset management purposes? What is the likely end use of that information downstream? Is it for costing? Is it for database information? Is it for asset management and life cycle purposes? If that's the case then tell us up front because then it's the case that we can go in and build models differently and put information in it. And then it's the case that once it gets handed over, more information can be added to it, or this information can be used as a reference for other projects. Uh, it might be that um, a survey model from us is used directly in another model environment. It might just be that some of our elements are used as a reference, as a background. Knowing that from the start, it does dictate how we build it, how much we put into it. And again, there's lots of possibilities, automated extractions, plenty of software for automatically fitting stuff based on algorithms, now, the accuracy of which can vary. A lot of software gets better and better. Um, decent results out of it. I mean, there's 80% reductions in some of our workflows based on some of the softwares. Um, there's always QA processes behind it. Um, but it's a case of once we can do something, we'll do it. Um, if it's quicker and faster and better quality. Um, but there's a lot of ways we can work with other softwares. And again, structural inspections visual, general, principal inspections, inspections, little graph there of the UAV, but um, there's a lot of different ways um, we can get information. Um, hydrographic surveys, you can see on the right there's an information tag down below, um, but that's the level of information we can provide in laser scans. You can see, I hope clearly, but the surface um, below the waterline. Um, Parametric data, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and different deliverables from that. Um, but you can see quite clearly what's there. It's essentially the same thing, it's just on the Yeah, so. yeah. So it's, it's very, very easy. I mean, anyone looking at that can see um, what information they can get out of that. Um, we can provide that once it's specified. Um, and just project highlights from that, but yeah. I think we're probably caught for time now, so I'll just, what can we do for you, essentially, is what we want out of this. Um, Reducing your risks, delivery, deliver projects on program, on budget, on time. Um, we can offer advice and guidance on survey requirements. Again, it depends on what exactly a project is heading, where it's heading to, what it's going to be used for. Um, collaborating on projects. There's a lot of different ways we can help clients and help contractors um, on these projects. I think the more we can use that experience and more that advice, the better, I think, for, for both parties, essentially. Um, and again, 
insurance, confidence with quality and safety. One thing that we do as well, um, support on both UK and Irish projects, we operate both in the UK and Ireland, I think that's quite important. Um, a lot of people work on jobs um, both in the UK and Ireland, but they use different companies. I think a lot of companies operate in one or the other. We operate in both. I think that sets us apart from a lot of other companies. Um, I think it's quite important. Um, I think that's it. That's what I hope to get out of it. Well, thanks very, thanks very much. Any uh, questions? You're probably maybe going away with more <laughs> questions now than you had when you came <laughs> in. So, uh, but I think that was the idea. I think uh, Alpha thank you for inviting us along. Um, but um, the idea was really to see it from our point of view, I guess, and to put uh, how you would implement BIM from a survey perspective and what considerations you should have when drawing up specifications and plans and when you come to you come knocking on our door, what do we expect? And I suppose uh, hopefully you got a bit of a picture of that. And like and, and also for maybe from an implementation on site, how you would how you would expect to see it go once you have it designed. So if you're a designer or a consultant or or even a contractor, how you would expect to see kind of the data being flown. Well, okay, so thanks very much.